No glitches. <laughs> How many folks had a pickle juice martini last night? <laughs> that, that, it, I won't say it's better than the NorCal margarita, but it's a really nice compliment, I'll tell you that. So that, that farm dinner last night was absolutely right. amazing. Cool. Yeah. That was my question. It was about pickle juice. Well, more broadly, it was about uh, mineral supplementation. You know, uh, <laughs> considering grass-fed, organic, uh, paleo diet, is it necessary to supplement with minerals? Uh, my take on this as a uh, supplement manufacturer and distributor is no. Um, <laughs> uh, and, and just sort of as a uh, background story, I've been in the supplement business for almost 30 years, and I entered it as a, uh, as a means of trying to find ways to assist athletes improve performance uh, by providing things that they couldn't necessarily get from their diet, whatever that diet was. Uh, but as I got more and more into this realm of, um, of primal, paleo, ancestral, let's call the whole thing off, uh, I, um, I, I saw that uh, so many of the uh, deficiencies that we normally see in athletes who have a high carbohydrate diet and lots of sugar and lots of omega-6 oils and things like that uh, was probably the root cause of all the not all, but a lot of the min mineral deficiencies. Um, and the, the idea that um, perhaps, you know, the, the, the phytates binding with some of the minerals and, and a lot of these other um, things that we talk about uh, in, the, in the broad context of a uh, primal uh, or paleo diet, um, it may uh, cross over into, for instance, women who have osteoporosis. They don't have osteoporosis necessarily because they're not throwing enough calcium at their bones. They have it because of some other um, metabolic issues that relate to the foods that they were eating uh, being inappropriate for absorbing calcium in that regard. So um, my basic take is that uh, other than uh, somebody who's on probably a uh, aggressive ketogenic diet, um, in, in which case you probably want to do some supplementation, or if you're on a very low carb, uh, beginning very low carb, uh, part of your weight loss strategy, in, in which case it's probably appropriate. But as you get, I, th I think, closer and closer to um, what I would call a, an ideal body composition, it's probably less and less critical to do that, provided, you're, pr provided you still have at the base of your food pyramid um, substantial vegetables. And you, just to uh, maybe add a little bit to that, I have a can of Mark's Master Formula with the, the packs in my pantry, and I usually use like one or two a week, but it's very random. So for me, I'm a little bit, I'm looking at it more almost as a hormetic stressor than I am as potentially a, a nutrient deficiency. But I, I think given the level of stress I have, we just had a baby and all the rest of that stuff, like I kind of drop that in just as a safeguard, but I really randomize it. I mean, Art Devaney was talking about that in like, 95, 98, you know, instead of being super pedantic about it, it's like use these things, but be a little bit intelligent, think about the ancestral life way, uh, try to have some kind of modulated input so that you, you're diversifying toxin loads. Like that, this is another thing that uh, just eating one variety of food all the time, you're pumping one, you, you're, you're pumping typically one type of a flavor of toxicants or even vitamins through metabolic pathways without diversifying that. And then you can overwhelm those systems versus you know, mixing stuff up a little bit. So I, I, I think it's a, a thing, again, where there's a lot of individual variability. You think about like, if somebody's hypochloritic, they have low stomach acid, what is the likelihood that they're getting adequate mineral absorption, fat soluble vitamins, really, really low. And this is why a lot of the people who have hypochloridia or, or other gastrointestinal problems, they have uh, fingernail ridges and stuff like that. They have uh, dental issues with our, our dentist up here who's, who's talk, talking to us. So, you know, simply saying, okay, well, I eat a paleo diet, I'm, I'm good or primal, that's, that's so surface and we're not considering the individual, we're not considering their stress. Are they police, military, fire, medical? Because they're doing shift work and then they end up with hypochloridia. They have abnormal gut bacteria. You know, I mean, there's so many extenuating stories there that it's really important. I think that this is, uh, not to get like wax philosophical here, but uh, I, I think there is such a potent desire for folks to say, this is the thing, this is it. The, you know, 
this is where the orthodox paleoites live and, and this is the way that we're going to do it. And we do ourselves a disservice with that because it's where the pissing mass would start and it, it limits our ability to really be able to customize this stuff. We have a template that we should then intelligently look at our individual circumstances and then make some informed decisions off that. And sometimes the decisions will be wrong and sometimes they'll be right, but it's a lot better than trying to spackle this, this uh, one size fits all approach to all this. Thank you very much. Can I add just one more quick question? Or? Uh, it was really in light of the fact that most of the soil in the Western world is kind of denuded of minerals. I, I just didn't know if that factored into, you know, the vegetables. Yeah, I mean, I, having said what I said about uh, just blanket, uh, I think the first thing you need to do is fix, uh, you know, your diet to, to eliminate some of the things that are probably causing issues. Um, Part of that, uh, if, you, if you look back at the daily values and the RDIs and the RDAs as they were first constructed in the 40s and 50s, um, and they were based on um, some assumptions, one of which was a, a, a grain-based diet. So I think in many cases, probably uh, 1,100 uh, milligrams of calcium a day for women is probably too much. It's probably inappropriate if you've, if you've rid yourself of some of the other factors. So maybe the mineral requirements aren't even as high as we originally thought they were. Um, and, but, but again, having said that, if you do have these issues, then certain amounts of supplementation are, can still be appropriate. And um, I came up with a, a, a new product idea after what you just said, fractal formula. Hmm? <laughs> See? Once in a while. How often do you take it? Once in a while. Well, no, you just, you, you just, uh, you randomize what's in it. That's it. And you, you, That's it. Yeah. Black box. And you actually push it. We, we have Black somebody box. from the FDA here, so we yeah, push yeah. it through. We're like, no, 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 this is yeah. fractal dosing. Yeah. Like, so <laughs> it's just uh, the error bars are bigger than what you yeah. claim are in the samples. Hopefully may may contain. Get this. Yeah. yeah, it might contain, yeah. but then again, it might not. Yeah. 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 All right. Next. Um, just a comment and then a question. First, uh, to you two guys and Dr. Eaton and everybody here, thank you very much for bringing all this stuff into the mainstream. And, Helping everybody here and helping us, and helping me. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> now, at the risk of Rob jumping across the table and turning me into some kind of pretzel with a BJJ move after what he just said, and going to be my question. Being a, one of those broken guys that's a firefighter, paramedic, shift work, can't sleep, all the other metabolic issues that come along with that. Um, General broad brush recommendations that can help with sleep other than sleeping in the dark room and knowing what we already know. Is there anything new, any better way of dealing with what we have to deal with? Uh, I mean, the, the, the classic stuff, which I can't say it again or enough, you know, like pitch black room, really good sleep hygiene so that when you are, are getting ready to go to bed, like it's kind of a consistent, I, I like to say like serial killer consistency. And <laughs> if you see my handwriting, then it's completely Charles Manson. So, it, you know, it's like consistent there. Um, I, I think that depending on what the individual has going on, you know, like the, I, I made the recommendation that maybe uh, uh, first responders should be using some low dose uh, you know, metformin under the guidance of their doctor, obviously, all the rest of that stuff. But, you know, if we reverse metabolic problems, then we tend to antagonize the production of cortisol. And if there's one thing that's going to shut down sleep is elevated cortisol. And so maybe as some diagnostic stuff, just doing like a four point ASI to figure out where you are in that spectrum, being really intelligent with your training. So I mentioned some metabolic conditioning for first responders, police, military, fire, you know, like uh, medical workers. But there's a desire. It, it seems like people will either sit on the couch until they die or when they get off the couch, then they attempt to commit suicide every time they work out. And, it, you know, there's like the appropriate dose. And within the CrossFit scene, there used to be this kind of economics oriented deal where we're going to do a minimum dose with a maximum return. And that's traded off with how much can we do without dying? You know, work capacity of Ross corrupt broad time and modal domains. What that translates into, how much can you do without dying? And I think that that is antagonistic towards sleep because, you know, the cortisol axis and all that. So getting all that stuff kind of squared away. And then on the supplementation side, depending on what you have going on, maybe GABA, maybe melatonin, definitely some uh, 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 like the fizzy magnesium stuff. I, I have a doc who, who I, I've been fighting the idea that transdermal magnesium works. I'm like, bollocks, it can't work. But he, he just threw me a bunch of papers that 
claim that people sitting in Epsom salt baths that they, they did uh, blood work on them and they can see uh, plasma magnesium go up. And so I have said bollocks on this for so long and because I couldn't find any good papers on it. And then he just threw a bunch to me. So maybe like a magnesium salt bath. So there's some things that we know are pretty good at inducing relaxation. Um, and that's about it. I mean, th this is part of the, the thing that for our police, military, fire, and medical workers, like we, we need to be more intelligent about how we, we structure their shifts because there are better and worse ways to have people come on and off shift. Most uh, excessive force, uh, I've been really tied in with the, um, the uh, police chief scene on the national level, virtually every excessive force scenario that, that pops up in the news is immediately following a shift change for the police officer. So you, you've just had your sleep disturbed, you go out there, you get put in a difficult situation, and you're cranky, and you make a bad decision, potentially. You know, so that's stuff that we need to think about. Yeah, maybe more fats. Yeah, so d does that help a little bit? I mean, like, you, you know, so some of these classic sleep aids, uh, melatonin, GABA, but depending on how, you know, what it is that you need to deal with, but uh, making sure that you're dealing with um, cortisol, uh, phosphatidylserine, like two to 600 milligrams of phosphatidylserine before you go to sleep can suppress cortisol production. But if you're at the end of adrenal fatigue and you're not producing enough cortisol, then that could cause a lot of problems. So, yeah, again, find a good doc to do all that with. Right. Thanks. Yeah. Mm. Oh. <laughs> um, with a booster seat. <laughs> um, uh, what are your thoughts about icing for uh, whether icing yeah. is primal paleo or beneficial <laughs> for chronic or acute injuries? Um, well, I'll, I'll lead off on that. I mean, my own experience with icing has never been good. And I've always sort of fought it, um, not, not intellectually as much as just intuitively. Um, and I've never really had, uh, and I've had, a, I've had my share of injuries. Um, and I, f I find actually that some amount of heat uh, works for me better than ice. So uh, I'm seeing now in the literature there's a movement toward getting away from this um, aggressive icing of an injury immediately uh, post. Um, on the other hand, in terms of um, some kind of uh, chronic inflammation, uh, I, I do subscribe to the idea that maybe a, a soak in a tub for uh, a couple of minutes might be a good hormetic stressor uh, to add to the, to the complement of your recovery. Uh, one of the greatest marathoners that ever lived, a New Zealand guy named Jack Foster, um, swears that his longevity was uh, as a result of his having stood in his backyard and hosed his legs off with a garden hose after every run he ever did. So there's, you know, clearly anecdotal, but um, I'm not, with regard to this, again, aggressive icing post-trauma, post I'm not a big fan of that, and particularly now that I've read more of the science. I do think that uh, some, it's, it's really about um, getting blood flow to, to get to that area and clear waste away and bring in new nutrients and, and uh, to a certain extent decrease swelling. But um, if anybody read uh, K-Star's recent, one of the recent uh, mobility wad pieces, it was about, and I've agreed with, I've thought about this for a long time as well, and, and now the orthopedic community says this, which is basically, we're going to get you up and moving as soon as we can after, after a, a surgery or after an, an incident. So one of the new treatments is to actually move within reason up to a point of pain or just to mild pain um, as soon as you can after an injury will we'll probably help speed up the recovery. Yeah, the only thing I'd add, or just to kind of springboard off that, like somebody has a ACL repair and then they throw them immediately in a CPM, continuous passive movement machine, you know, and they, they start bending and flexing. And part of what we're thinking about with this is that when we're trying to heal, you can have kind of a spastic healing, which is a bunch of amorphous scar tissue, or you can have tissue that is laid down in a way that we actually have support structure that is advantageous, you know, like if you want a, a protein matter running in this direction versus like an amorphous mass because you're, you're, you know, you're loading through the patella, you don't want scar tissue just, that's just all kind of gnarlied up. And interestingly, having a pretty significant inflammatory response is critical in that. There's uh, different prolotherapies, uh, thing, things of that nature that, you know, they will actually induce inflammation in a joint or, or in a, a particular compartment in the body to try to speed, you, you know, do you need to kickstart the inflammatory process? Keloid scarring 
is actually a scar that's gone partially through the, the healing process and then it stops. And there are certain drugs and, and uh, I think like St. John's wort oil and stuff like that that will re-stimulate the inflammatory response and move things through. I think that occasionally, you know, sometimes just palliative, it may feel good to throw some ice on there, but it, it's kind of making sense. But again, like it, this is the systemic effect of jumping in an ice bath is different than the localized effect of trying to turn all the inflammation off because you, you, you know, you have some tennis elbow type thing. That's completely different than the systemic effect of jumping in, getting a hormetic stressor, getting the full body insulin sensitizing. So it's important to remember, you know, 30,000 feet versus, you know, right, right at that local level. Thanks guys. Totally. Yeah. Thanks. She was waiting longer. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> So I'm coming from more of a longevity interest than an athleticism kind of interest, and I'm scoping out an ultra-high-fat diet as a possibility of that. Um, Mark, I think on one of your blog posts, you uh, disclosed being maybe the, the 55, 60% range for fat intake. I'm wondering what you guys think of, of going higher than that. Are there any problems? Um, yeah, I, I think one of the things that I've arrived at um, personally is a recognition uh, and Ron Rosedale is another person who would probably um, be in this camp, that, that the less glucose you burn in a lifetime, the better off you are, which doesn't mean zero glucose. It doesn't mean, you know, very low carb all the time. But it means trying to aggressively, um, you know, find ways to in, improve your fat intake and your fat metabolism, and, and, and that includes how you uh, move to support that, um, uh, that lifestyle. And that's uh, ultimately the... the Primal Blueprint was about taking a look at the recipe for a healthy human and, and putting in all of these component parts that we know to be there, a broad base of very low level aerobic activity, um, you know, uh, plants and animals, and all of the things that we talk about, avoiding toxins. But ultimately, um, glucose, in my mind, is probably, you're probably better off reducing as much as you can over a lifetime. And yet, one of the new strategies that we're going to be incorporating is sort of a, a cyclical, um, you know, we use periodicity in, in training and we'll, we can use that in life too. So you go through periods of time where you are uh, maybe uh, very low carb and other times where you kind of come out of that and you, you're not in, so you're not uh, a, a ketogenic guy for the rest of your life, but there's times when you go into ketosis and it's very beneficial and it cleans up some of the, some of the debris that uh, is one of the intentions of, of ketosis. And then you come out and you, you know, uh, explore some of the uh, flavor options that are, that are not available on a, on a ketogenic diet. Um, but um, uh, I think that, uh, I mean, uh, Peter at Hyperlipid is a guy who's been probably 80% fat for years and years and years, seems to do very well on it. Uh, so I don't, I don't see much harm in that, but I, but I, I would be, just for, because we don't have the data, I wouldn't necessarily plan the rest of my life to be ketogenic. I, I think an interesting development, if, if folks want to do some uh, searching, Michael Rose from uh, University of uh, UC Irvine, and it, a lot of his stuff sounds a lot like what Art Devaney talks about, and they were in the same building, so I, I can't help but think that they probably had lunch a lot or something, but uh, he, he had some really interesting papers that basically described the fact that uh, caloric restriction in humans was probably not going to extend life. And, and uh, there, there's some interesting things, genetic reaction norms, like how organisms respond to various inputs and uh, from survival standpoints and whatnot, like if, if you look at the amount of energy that an organism puts into child rearing, and if you curtail energy input, then it's likely to extend life. But for humans, that doesn't seem to be the case. And so that for me, it was kind of like, Okay, fine. So I'm not going to do calorie restriction, be cold, skinnier than I already am, hypogonadal and everything else to live longer. It's like, it's just not going to work, so why even try it? So that was kind of cool. So then you're, you're kind of like, what, what can I do just so that, you know, maybe, maybe I don't live longer in total time, but the amount of time that I have is much, you know, more productive, and, and I forestall that decline. One of the key features of that, there's a great paper, uh, Secrets of the Lac Operon, which talks about nutrient partitioning and how we, we uh, uh, are able to be flexible with the, the fuel substrates that we use. And basically one of the characteristics of aging is that you lose the ability to mobilize fat as a primary fuel source and you become more and more glycolytic. 
what, what's a primary tissue that is exclusively glycolytic? Glycolytic. Blood cells. Oh, come on, folks. Red blood cells. Mm. Cancer. Cancer. The Warburg effect. So as you age, and if you age ineffectively, you start looking a hell of a lot more like cancer than what you would ever want to look like cancer. So one of these things that we can do is a cyclic low-carb approach, which is what I had done for, for years, you know, just for like athletics, and it seems to be this kind of middle ground. I, I see a graph of performance, health, and longevity, and we, we clearly know from data from professional athletes that a performance orientation will antagonize health and longevity at some point. There was just some, some research that uh, professional football players have an average lifespan of 58 years, so we need to really work to keep John Wellborn uh, uh, <laughs> toast up on fish oil and keep the big lug alive till he's like 90. So, you know, it, it's... Uh, but the, this is the, the stress, and I think a lot of it is oxidative damage and impact and all this, and so we can mitigate those things by a cyclic low carb, and part of that element of the cyclic low carb is this hormetic effect again. We have a moderate carb intake today, which is going to upregulate all of the kind of detox enzyme pathways that deal with a larger carbohydrate intake five days down the road. So it's these punctuated equilibrium moments where we you know, you maybe have higher, higher carb for a day and then much higher carb six days later, and then you're immunized against that high carb meal later, but it's causing you, it's forcing you to be metabolically flexible in the substrates that you're using. And I think that's very, very beneficial for long-term health. This is all super speculative. And this is one of the things that makes me a little bit nuts about like, well, it needs an RCT. It's like design an RCT for this <laughs> tiger. You know, it's like there's, there's so much stuff out there that just is going to defy throwing it into a randomized control trial. And so do we just sit there and like sit on our hands and wait, well, I, I don't know, we can't do an RCT, so we shouldn't speculate about it and do some tinkering. I think that we have enough understanding of some metabolic pathways that we can make a reasonably educated thought about what we're doing and don't become religious about it and go nuts or anything, but you know, we can we can make some informed decisions about you know, what's going on because we understand a little bit of the metabolic machinery and we can make some informed decisions on that. I also think we know the outs where the outside margins are so that we can play with this individually. So that we can, you know, we talk a lot about the experimental one. And if you've gotten to the point where you've been in this arena for a while, uh, it's, it's appropriate for you to maybe uh, play around with it a little bit and see what, see what your own results are. You're not going to do any damage to yourself let, doing that. Let me throw this out there. I've been doing more safe starches and my LDLP has gone up dramatically. So I'm going to start eating ketogenic again. So, yeah. And I, it, which I had eaten cyclic low carb where I would go like, you know, six days, uh, very low carb and then have a reasonably large carb meal and then three days and then two days and then six days, three days, two days. And I just kind of broke it up like that. And when I did that, I had blood lipids that would make, you know, any cardiologist let weep. And now they don't look that good. My triglycerides are higher, everything's higher. So I obviously am not all that carb tolerant. But uh, I know Matt Lalonde has been tinkering with more carbs, and he ended up putting like eight pounds of muscle on, and he's leaner than I've ever seen him. So that's where that experimentation, yeah. n equals yeah. one, tinkering. We've got some general ideas. And then you need to get in and tinker, and, and it's kind of like putting on a pair of jeans. It's like, does my ass look good in this or not? I don't know. You, do, you don't know until you try. So, yeah. 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 Okay, um, we haven't spoken much about gender differences with these ancestral diets, and a lot of complaints you know, from women, they, they will say, I'm holding on to more fat, or postmenopausal women, does it matter? Are we supposed to hold on to more fat? Um, you know, should we be trying to lean down as much as our male counterparts, you know? Yeah. I, that, this has been a, uh, in the last couple of years, I've noticed this a lot in the comment boards and in the, in the forums. And so my take on this is that, first of all, if you are in a position where you've come from uh, any kind of metabolic damage or any kind of overweight or any kind of uh, issue and you've addressed some of these issues through this strategy of eating, um, you've gotten rid of PCOS, you've gotten rid of your uh, type 2 diabetes, you've lost some weight. Um, there, women tend to hit a plateau sometimes sooner than men. And uh, it calls to question, in my mind, the concept of ideal body composition. And my take on that is that if you get to a point where you plateau and you may not be satisfied because you're not yet ready for the cover of Victoria's Secret Catalog, it doesn't mean that you failed. It's, it's a sign that your body is saying, I love what you've done with the place. 
you know, I want to stay here. I want to. <laughs> I want to stay here a while. And if if you're not sick, if you have the energy that you need, if you maintain that weight without fighting it and without having a calorie count, um, if you're able to go about your life, then then all other things being equal, what's the problem? So now we, but, but then the problem becomes, because of the society that we live in, damn it, I want to get down to 13, I'm a woman and I want to get down to 13% body fat. Maybe it's not in the cards for you. So, but that's got to be okay, because this is, first and foremost, this is about reclaiming health. The other stuff, the look good naked, comes later, and sometimes it doesn't come at all, and that's got to be okay too, because it's got to be about uh, an acceptance of, of the health that you, and, the, and the recognition of what you've done to get to, to reclaim new health. And then from there you can decide. But sometimes there are costs attached to getting to the next level. You may have to work really hard. You may have to, now you may have to start sacrificing and suffering. Now you may even get sick more often and, uh, and not live as long just because you wanted to be on the cover of Shape magazine. Parents recently switched over because my father had um, a cholesterol issue and uh, insulin resistance, and we convinced him to switch. So my parent, my mother's in her 70s. She's doing it with him, and she's con constantly complaining that he's losing weight and she's not losing weight, and so it's not working for yep. her. And but she's healthy; she has no health issues. That's the question: Does can I confidently say to her, "Does it matter? You're holding on to the weight. You know, that's where you need to be at 75." Yes. Or, who yeah. who remembers the blog post that I did on in my I'm eating paleo, am I losing enough weight? So what's the take home on the weight loss deal? What do you do with your scale? You put a bow on it and find somebody you hate and give it to them and let it make them neurotic. So I mean, that, that's where like um, finding performance orientation, like the scale tells us nothing. You know, if, if, you're, if the magic fairy could come up and say, okay, uh, you know, you can look however you want, but when you step on the scale, it's going to say 150 kilos, like, you know, 300 yeah, yeah. plus pounds. Who cares? Do you care? You're no, you don't care. Like, if you look, look, feel, and perform the way you want, but the scale is going to magically, you know, it's going to be like somebody's going to push down on it. And when people change this stuff around, your mom, I would wager, probably had some sarcopenia. She maybe had some osteoporosis brewing. Like, you know, there's probably a bunch of stuff there that's being reversed. And so the scale isn't giving her good feedback. And that's where, like, a simple hip waist measurement, a before and after photo, and then having some performance orientation. And if that's like going to the end of the stop sign that's a quarter mile away and back and she times it and that's her kind of performance metric, cool. But if you focus on performance, this is one of the, the cool things that I really liked about what CrossFit has brought to the scene is that when people are performance oriented, they don't do squirrely eating habits. Anorexia and bulimia goes out the window because if a chick comes in the gym today and she's got three pull-ups, and then she's not eating enough or binging and purging over the weekend. She comes in on Monday and she has no pull-ups. And then she gets her ass kicked in front of all of her peers. And they're like, what went on? And they're like, I had a bad food weekend, but that's done. That's behind me now. And so when we focus on performance and let the aesthetics come as an outgrowth of, you know, form, form follows function kind of, kind of gig, then we don't have those problems. And a lot of these other issues that pop up, the eating disorder and stuff like that are gone. Yeah. Uh, my question is is concerning um, an unwanted outcome of CrossFit, which I just started about a year ago. And um, the problem, I'm wondering how common it is, number one, and number two, is there anything that those of us who are suffering from this can, can do? Um, so that problem when you have your sit bone, so no matter when you're sitting, what you're doing is becomes incredibly painful. I guess they call it bursitis or tendonitis of the ischial tuberosity, something Yikes. like that? Does that sound <laughs> well, familiar? Yeah, that's, that's up close and personal, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah TMI. So, um, you know, I've had it all my life, and it goes away when I get fatter, and then when I get more mm. muscly and thinner and doing CrossFit, I'm in pain all the time when I'm sitting, you know, whether it's driving in the car. So obviously, okay, the solution is never sit. Right. Which Damn, you, you, you took my smart-ass response from me. Really? Damn it. Really? There, next question. Right, 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 right. Just well, you got to sit to ride your bike. Right. you got to no, sit don't. to drive. Oh, that's true. That's true. <laughs> what am I going to do? I can't sit anymore. No answer for that. Uh, that that's generic. Uh, it's real specific to, to you. I know you... you you find people who have the same the same issue, but I mean I don't know whether it's the, the form that you're using and in, in the lifts so that you're no doing like or solution. There's, no. I mean this, again the solution is uh, is is 
you know, the kind of stretching that you might want to do to maintain the robust flexibility that you need to have and not so not depend so much on the strength and the and, and completing the wad as much as the health aspect of this. You know, what, what is it going to take to, to keep me mobile for the rest of my life, not to k kick some 26 year old's ass in this workout? But, but some of this is just like the, the backside has less padding and then you, you end up having some problems sitting. Yeah. Maybe just like one of those uh, physio balls, the big yeah. inflatable. Yeah. Or the stand-up desk. Or the stand-up yeah. desk, which I, I do both. You know, I, I do a lot of writing and, and uh, uh, we'll do, you know, 40 minutes standing, 40 minutes on my, on my sit-down deal, and then I'll actually take my laptop and throw it in the floor and then lay down an extension. So I've heard levitation is becoming more of a reality. Yeah, that's probably a different that conference, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, that's the Berkeley conference for sure. <laughs> So we have like five minutes, so we should definitely right. boogie, boogie down. I'll make this quick. Um, my question per pertains to intermittent fasting, and I know you've both kind of spoken on that a lot. Like everybody else here, uh, I'm very busy. I, I'm getting a master's degree. I got a kid. I'm a firefighter. I'm worried about getting it into my, into my regular routine and elevated stress levels. So what physical and physiological like, indicators should I be looking out for to say that I'm too stressed if, if I do implement it? And twofold, what is, what is your take on intermittent fasting and having, say, 150 calories worth of like a clean protein, just a straight prey, uh, whey protein in the morning and maybe a couple hours later, like another 50 calories uh, to prevent muscle degradation? I, I, I think that that's a smart way to go. You could do whey protein. You could do branched chain amino acids. Um, Martin Burkham from Lean Gains has really tinkered with that stuff a lot. Uh, the, the thing that you want to be careful about is when we start elevating cortisol, it antagonizes testosterone production. We get a pregnenolone steal, and that stuff is so insidious. And once you head down that path, it's a little bit like heat stroke. Like once you've started doing it, it is so easy to go back there, and you are already in a lifestyle that facilitates being cortisol you know, overloaded. So I would just be really careful with that. I, if anything else, the intermittent fasting literature, what it tells me is that we don't need to be neurotic about eating every two hours to maintain muscle mass. But if you have a very stressful lifestyle, then I don't know that I would really advocate it. Like I would try to do those things that mit mitigate stress as much as possible. So I would be really careful with it. I, I agree. I think what we're trying to do here is we're trying to, to, um, to, to retrain our bodies to be good fat burners and to be able to use ketones. Uh, and, and so I use intermittent fasting only when it's forced upon me. Uh, you know, if I'm traveling and, I, and I'm on a cross-country flight that's not going to have any good food or whatever, I'll, I'll choose to not eat rather than eat crap. Um, because I have the skills, I have the ability to cruise and not have it affect me. Um, so intermittent fasting, purposeful intermittent fasting, is really good for people who want to lose a lot of weight or people who are really into the anti-aging strategy of if I'm fasting, you know, theoretically I'm going to be repairing DNA, I'm going to be consuming damaged proteins and fats and things like that as part of that. But again, in a stressful occupation and with a fit guy, it's, it's probably better just used as, uh, as a tool to assist you when it's forced upon you that you don't have to worry about tearing into muscle tissue because that doesn't happen anymore because now when you, when you don't eat, you just burn fat. We're good. One minute. Quick okay. question, quick answer. Contra controversial question, though. Um, <laughs> That's a good rapper. In, uh, in uh, <laughs> Norway, in my country, in uh, Europe, um, the team that's currently leading the soccer elite uh, division has been on the low-carb, high-fat, paleo diet for six, seven years. And this obviously is very controversial. And this is a club with very small resources, and they have outstanding numbers, uh, better performance after they switched to this diet. We see that especially with uh, players coming from other clubs that use high carb. Uh, they lose a lot of fat very fast, and we're talking about top, top football players. Um, but on the other hand, we have had a lot of, well, we had had several incidents with top athletes having heart attacks that are on a high carb diet. Uh, controversial questions, but I was wondering if you had some thoughts about this uh, because we have seen it in Manchester City, Manchester United, several Norwegian I, I, clubs. I, I think when we start talking about professional athletics, like diet is huge, but this, the stress that people are subjected to in professional athletics, like I, I, I would love to jump on this and just be like, high carbs kill, don't do it, you know, but um, trying to maintain some steeping and some, you know, scientific rigor in the whole thing, it, it, it's common 
it, when you look in the literature, uh, uh, you know, like uh, electrical disturbances of the heart that lead to death in professional athletes. We had a rash of that in uh, NBA basketball a number of years ago. And it was completely unrelated to diet, or I would say largely unrelated to diet. And there were some genetic factors that then were selected for because of the stress of the training that they were undergoing. So I would be disinclined to really hang much of that on diet, personally. And maybe we have a cardiologist in here that would comment differently, but. I'm not a cardiologist, but we do know there's some uh, preliminary research indicating that high carb, particularly uh, on carbo loading, has been associated with electrical disturbance, atrial fibrillation. Okay. And so carb loading can cause problems. Um, and it can yeah, cause arrhythmia. Really so the, you know, what I ask is, what, was, what caused a heart attack? Was it a clot or was it electrical disturbance? Oh, it was a, a heart. Um, uh, no, 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 not black arteries. It was a heart. Um, so it's an electrical. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. So, so, so yeah. Yeah. hybrids oh, oh. can are related yeah. with that. Yeah. 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 I mean, I've. I've, for a while, I kept a registry of all my friends in the endurance community who had either died or had a defibrillator or had a heart transplant, uh, and, it, and I stopped counting when it was 50. And Art Devaney does the same thing, and we look at all of these uh, otherwise healthy athletes that, that drop dead. And I know cardiologists in L.A. who specialize in athletes and who say there's, there's a, um, a pandemic, an epidemic of uh, AFib in endurance athletes because of the um, thickening of the, of the uh, wall of uh, left ventricular hypertrophy yeah hypertrophy which which if you look at what um, chronic cardio does it's it, the heart is not it's it's a demand based organ you don't it doesn't say i got to stop your brain tells your body to move and the heart goes all right i got to go along for the ride so you can override this and cause the heart to have to go to work too hard and then ironically we feed it with with sugars and carbohydrates because that's what we're told the heart, you know, needs to, to, to work, and over time, I think we we see some problems. So I probably I would I would suspect that there is a dietary component in elite endurance athletes as to why they're having a lot of these problems. Yeah, I, I would just not discount the uh, physical activity as the as a big factor in that. But yeah, yeah, 100 miles a week of running. Yeah, yeah. and I think we're out of time, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you, everybody, Thank for you. coming. Yeah, yeah. yeah. thanks. Thanks, Mark. Yeah.